David, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for coming. Truly appreciate this. Um, it is my pleasure to have you in this sixth Capitalism and Morality Seminar. Um, those people who don't know me, I'm Jayant Bhandari, um, and I'm the host of this event. Um, Capitalism and Morality is a seminar to discuss the philosophy of liberty and freedom. It is my belief that without changing the characters of the individuals and without changing the cultures of our societies, a creative and free society is not possible. Uh, and I fully agree and that a lot of our institutions particularly that of the government, is tyrannical. But simply blaming and shouting against the sociopaths who rule us makes no difference to the society. The only choice we have is to awaken the individual. And that is what libertarianism is all about, awaken the individual. And that's what this seminar attempts to do. And if nothing else, my satisfaction comes from the fact that by gaining a deeper understanding of human nature and humanity, I prepare myself to live a happy, free, and creative life. To this seminar, I welcome you. Our first speaker is uh, Roslyn Ross. Roslyn lives in Nicaragua. Uh, she has spent her adult life questioning what parenting must be like in a free society. As someone, as someone me, who has spent the last three decades of my life trying to undo the conditioning that I went through in the prior 18 years of my life, I find Rosalind works more important than anything I can imagine. The ecology that we provide to the kids makes or breaks their lives. Um, Rosalind has recently published her latest book, A Theory of Objectivist Parenting. Uh, and she runs a blog called Raising Children is an Act of Philosophy. And uh, right now, she's working on, on her next book, which is expected to be published early last year. And the book is going to be called Raising Children in Reality. Uh, Rosalind has many intriguing thoughts. And I heard her for the first time at Libertopia in San Diego two years back. And I was enthralled. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rosalind Ross. my timer going to make sure that I don't go over. And I might talk very fast for these reasons. Good morning. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. I had so much fun last night. I was getting to know everyone and I see a bunch of people I don't know this morning. but. I can't wait to get to know you guys, too. Um, I'm going to talk pretty fast sometimes. If I get too fast, um, just go like this, and I will try to slow it down. Um, I have a lot to, that I want to get through, a lot that I want to share with you. And, um, and only I only get to talk twice today, so. Um, <laughs> human beings can relate to one another with either mutual respect and freedom or mutual attempts to control and force. Though I know many people who are fundamentally against relating to their fellow human beings with various methods of control, bribery, threats, manipulation, slavery, 
I know very few who hesitate to relate in that way to the young human beings we temporarily refer to as children. In this talk, I will argue that one of our biggest barriers to freedom is our current parenting ideology. I hope you will find that whether you have children or not, the information I share with you now will add to your vision of how human beings can relate to one another respectfully, regardless of age. The main current parenting ideology today is based on one simple rule. That's how I summarize it. Reward the behavior you wish to see continue. Punish the behavior you wish to see cease. As a professional executive nanny specializing in behavior modification, using that one rule, for many years I made children do what their parents thought was best for them, what the children would supposedly thank their parents for later. What I learned is that you can manipulate, coerce, require, or train children to do or be pretty much anything. But you cannot force children to be happy, genuinely happy with their lives. 10 years ago, this made no sense to me. How could a teenage girl, obese and flunking out of school, not be happier to be thin and on the honor roll? This was similar to something that happened when I was in college. I had just read Atlas Shrugged, and I gave it to everyone who was important to me. <laughs> I begged them to read it, but I couldn't make them read it. And even when they did read it, I couldn't make them care. Why is it that Atlas Shrugged, the first 10 pages, was so exhilarating for me and so boring for my friends? I will answer these questions shortly from now. I would like to propose that a controlled childhood does not usually create a free man. If we look at parenting from a philosophical angle, this makes perfect sense. Our current parenting ideology is based on behaviorism, which rests on the philosophical theory of determinism, the belief in human existence without consciousness, the belief that humans just respond to pain and pleasure, and we are victims of our pain and pleasure programming. This is the philosophy with which statism defends itself. Behaviorist parenting, the rewarding and punishing of children, will not usually create a free man because behaviors are just actions we take to meet our needs, to gain or keep what we value. When a parent controls a child's behavior with rewards and punishment, the parent severs the child's action from the child's values behind the action and, and makes himself, the parent, the value. Because the parent, not reality, determines when the child feels pain or pleasure, the child's entire orientation changes from reality to people as reality. In 1958, Nathaniel Brandon talked about the man who lives not in a universe of facts, but in a universe of people. People, not reason, are his tool of survival. It is on them that his consciousness must focus. It is they who he must understand or please or placate or deceive or maneuver or manipulate or obey. It is his success at this task that becomes the gauge of his fitness to exist. His metaphysics have been replaced by what Brandon calls social metaphysics. Because a child's metaphysical orientation will be largely determined before he is five years old, I think the main cause of social metaphysics is behaviorist parenting. For example, when a child hits and is put in timeout, his parents think they are teaching him to associate the pain of hitting with the pain of timeout. What the child actually learns is not that hitting will lead to pain, but rather not pleasing his parents will lead to pain. The child does not need to study, understand, and conquer nature if he wants to avoid pain. He needs to study, understand, and conquer his parents. Fast forward 15 years. This child raised on behaviorism is now in college. Offer him Atlas Shrugged or Reality TV. Which one will actually offer him more information about the reality he thinks he needs to study, understand, and conquer? And now you know why so many of my friends found Atlas Shrugged to be a waste of their time. In addition to destroying the child's metaphysics, behaviorism also destroys the child psychologically, moving the child from being intrinsically motivated, motivated by a self-interested pursuit of values, seeking personal satisfaction de um, derived from self-initiated achievement, to being extrinsically motivated, motivated by external rewards such as fame, grades, and praise, motivation that originates outside the individual. In his book, Teaching Johnny to Think, Leonard Peikoff assert, asserts that external motivators can be used for good instead of evil. 
But extrinsic motivators, by their very nature, require that we suppress our real feelings, desires, and values and replace them with someone else's. Extrinsic motivators beget collectivism. It does not matter at all what we are trying to do with extrinsic motivators. We can change the curriculum all we want. We can make it 100% Austrian economics. Likewise, it won't matter if we spank or use time out or do away with punishments altogether and focus on rewards. The method is the message. In Punished by Rewards, Alfie Cohn shows that the mechanisms of reward and punishment to control an adult's behavior only work if the adult was rewarded and punished as a child. The younger the rewards and punishments start, and the more consistently they are used, the more effective they will be, and the more necessary they will be. A system of rewards doesn't take advantage of a fundamental feature of human character. It turns people into reinforcement maximizing economic actors. Parents who use rewards and punishments are attempting to control their child's perception of reality so the child will make the decisions the parent wants him to make. The result for the child is confusion, insecurity, and his own ability to interpret reality, and massive repression. All of these things get in the way of rational thought. Ayn Rand wrote that the field of extrospection is based on the two cardinal questions, what do I know? and how do I know it? The field of introspection is based on the questions, what do I feel and why do I feel it? Extrinsic controls prevent these questions from being asked. Parents think they are teaching their children self-control, but really they are teaching emotional repression. You may not feel that. You may not talk to me until you have properly repressed what you are feeling. We do this to babies, shh. Why are we shushing them? Aletha Solter wrote, the repression of crying during infancy is so pervasive that most babies have well-established control patterns by the time they are six months old. These behaviors serve the purpose of repressing strong emotions. Common control patterns in babies include thumb sucking or pacifier sucking, frequent demands to nurse for comfort rather than hunger, and attachment to an object such as a special blanket or teddy bear. These behaviors that most parents think of as normal child behaviors are not normal outside of the Western world. By the time they are ready for preschool, teachers expect children to have learned somewhat to control their emotions. But what is meant by control is actually repression. The emotional stress of repression often manifests itself as facial tics, another behavior we consider normal in our three to five year olds that is not normal in the human race. Extrinsic controls teach children to ignore the emotional information they receive from their own minds. The result is that children often fail to develop an intrinsic self. Instead, they adopt an extrinsic, unreal self. Hence the epidemic today of 22-year-olds who have no idea what they enjoy doing just for the sake of doing it. They are motivated by money, prestige, winning, approval, and above all, by pats on the head for being good boys and girls. They use behaviorism on themselves. They promise themselves a new outfit if they lose 10 pounds or a week of self-loathing if they don't. And even if they read Atlas Shrugged and love it, they often don't know how to selfishly and righteously be themselves. Instead, they seek to be good little objectivists. Nathaniel Brandon wrote about how many good little objectivists he saw in his practice, people who missed the point, people who were trained from birth to miss the point. When admirers of, he wrote, when admirers of Ayn Rand seek my services professionally, they often come with the secret hope that with Nathaniel Brandon, they will at last become the masters of repression needed to fulfill the dream of becoming an ideal objectivist. I have known many men and women who, in the name of lofty beliefs, crucify their bodies, crucify their feelings, and crucify their emotional lives in order to live up to that which they call their ideals. Just like the followers of one religion or another, absorbed in some particular vision of what they think a human being can or should be, they leave the human being they actually are in a very bad place, a place of neglect and even damnation. Ayn Rand said, it's the hardest thing in the world to do what we want. Extrinsic controls make it the hardest thing in the world to even know what we want. This is why it seems that extrinsic motivators simply must be used. Research has shown that children's intrinsic motivation declines every year over the course of traditional schooling. By the time they are in high school, most children rarely display any 
intrinsic motivation whatsoever. Behaviorism creates the problem for which more behaviorism is the only solution. But science shows that behaviorism will only ever work in the short term and will backfire in the long term. Experiments done on how to best impose the value of altruism on young children have shown that children rewarded for altruistic behaviors will only behave altruistically as long as the adult is there to approve of them. They will, be, they will behave less altruistically when adults are not there. This is why extrinsically motivated adults find that like children, they're only good when someone else is watching. This is another impulse of collectivism. People want someone to make them do what they can't make themselves do. They say they vote for a nanny state to keep the bad people under control, but subconsciously they want a nanny for themselves. This is also one of the impulses of some religions. If you can only be good when <clears throat> someone else is watching, they have a solution for you. <coughs> this is what I didn't understand 10 years ago. You can get children to do or be pretty much anything, but goals achieved through external motivators will not make the child authentically happy. But what about for parents? Being in control of one's children, playing the part of a serene, loving dictator, it makes parenting seem so awesome in our heads. In reality, we can't be present with our child in this moment if we're busy thinking of ways to get him to do what we want him to do and monitoring to see if our strategy is working. We can't allow ourselves to be visible to the people we are trying to control. So you can't actually connect with your child. When we are controlling people, we can't allow ourselves to be truly seen by them because then or, I'm sorry, we can't allow ourselves to truly see them because then we would see the pain and suffering we are inflicting on them. So our tendency when we are controlling other people is to see their feelings as not real. That's not real pain children suffer when they cry. That's why controlling relationships can so easily lead to really atrocious behaviors because our tendency will be to fail to see the person we are trying to control as a person as with slaves or women or savages or heathens, we transform our adversary into something that needs to be controlled. Oh, children, they're irrational like rats. They feel safer when we control them. They need it. Even if we do see the feelings of those we control as real, our tendency is to convince ourselves their pain is okay, it's for their own good. In controlling relationships, the controller has a tendency to feel that he has not chosen to be in a relationship with those he is controlling. Rather, he sees himself as responsible for them, for their welfare, for their souls. It's hard to enjoy a relationship that is actually a duty. Since the parents don't see their children as real people with whom they can connect, they often end up putting on a show. For example, a man might play the role of good father and mow, mow the lawn and take out the trash and read to the kids and do bath time and help his wife with the dishes and get the highest paying job he can and work his butt off. And at first he will pat himself on the back as he thinks, I am such a good boy. But after a while, he will start to feel like being a good father is a huge obligation, a chore, a long list of things to do. And if he could admit it to himself, he might find that he resents his wife and children, whom he now sees as his slave drivers. But it's not them, it's the role, it's the lack of conscious awareness with which he is living his life. When we are playing roles, we have a tendency to not take responsibility for our choices. For example, someone playing the role of soldier or policeman may not very closely examine what he's doing or even feel responsible for the morality of his choices if he sees it as part of his role. He's just doing his job. Controlling relationships have a tendency to be exhausting. It takes a lot of energy to be an inauthentic actor to do what we believe we should do, to be good moms and dads, to suppress our true selves and how we really feel about reading the same book a hundred times. Whether we take on roles accidentally or whether roles are designed by those in power and handed to the masses for specific purposes, controlling the roles and scripts of a society is a great way to direct the sheeple without them knowing it. 
Those who create normal rule the world. Whether it's, this is what a nursery looks like. This is what an education looks like. This is what a good parent looks like. Our society's roles and scripts have tremendous power over us. For more than 100 years, the parenting role, perhaps the most important script to control, has been handed to us by academia, by the same people who teach Keynesian economics and Kantian philosophy. Perhaps, like me, you were trained from birth to accept academia as your church. But if you have questioned your indoctrination in other areas, it's time to question this one. Every conqueror since antiquity has known that he does not have to worry about those he has conquered. He just has to take over how their children are raised. It should not surprise us that in a culture where we benevolently dictate to our children, our, our government benevolently dictates to us. Ayn Rand said politics is the last consequence, the practical implementation of the fundamental ideas that dominate a given nation's culture. You cannot fight or change the consequences without fighting and changing the cause. If we don't want our government to be a benevolent dictatorship, our households cannot be benevolent dictatorships. If we want to live in a society more like God's Gulch, our households must be its model. Perhaps a lack of focus on parenting is the biggest flaw in the freedom movement. Pause. <laughs> Good, I'm making very good time. Yes. OK. Um, human beings can relate to one another with either mutual respect and freedom or mutual attempts to control and force. Though we may idealize the former, we were all raised with the latter. This makes it very hard, even for us, to imagine any other way to parent. William Thomas wrote, children have to be restrained from doing what they want to do and forced to do something else. They have to be put to bed and made to wash. We have been offered this dichotomy our entire lives. Either we control our children or they live lives of chaos. Either we make our kids go to bed and wash or they won't. If that were the choice, I would agree with Thomas, but that choice is a trick. That is not the choice. Similarly, Nathaniel Brandon advises parents to be warm but authoritative and cites a study that was done in which four types of parents were studied. Warmly authoritative, coldly authoritative, um, warmly permissive, and coldly permissive. Again, if those are the only choices, then by all means, parents should be warmly authoritative. But again, what we are being offered is a false dichotomy that only makes sense as long as we are stuck in what I call the operating system of free control and force. If a study were done on whether people prefer to exploit or be exploited in a trade, everyone in this room, I think, would see right through it. They would explain the operating system of freedom and respect, and in which they trade value for value, in which they would neither exploit nor be exploited in a trade. But this explanation would be incomprehensible to those who operate in a system of control, in which employers and employees are always adversaries trying to take advantage of one another. No matter how hard we try to explain that trade can be a win-win, people who operate in the system of control can only see things on the spectrum of control. Either you are exploiting me or I am exploiting you. Either I sacrifice myself to others or they sacrifice themselves to me. When my son was two years old, people kept asking me, is he defiant yet? This is a question that would only make sense to someone who operates in the system of control. I don't operate there, so I would say something like, well, to be defiant, one must have someone to defy. There must be a ruler and a subject and someone in control and someone being controlled. I don't relate to my son that way. And so the people would go, oh, <laughs> so you're permissive. <laughs> you just let your son do whatever he wants. If I'm not authoritative, I must be permissive. If I'm not the master, I must be the slave. This is the same false dichotomy. It's as if there are two operating systems and to live in one negates the existence of the other. Rue Cream wrote, you say that you have to pick him up and take him to the bath. I like to question my have to's, especially when they are leading to unhappiness for my children. What would happen if you didn't pick him up and take him? 
What would happen if he didn't take a bath that night? What message is he getting from being picked up and put somewhere he doesn't want to be? Is it truly more important that he take a bath than it is for the two of you to build a respectful relationship? William Glasser wrote, the vast majority of family unhappiness is the result of well-intentioned parents trying to make their children do what they don't want to do. Few of us parents are prepared to accept that it is our attempts to control that destroys the only thing we have with our children that gives us some influence over them, our relationship. The choice isn't control or chaos. The choice in human relationships doesn't change based on the age of the people involved. The choice is mutual respect or mutual attempts to control. In my relationship with my son, I see myself as an ambassador for Galt's Gulch. And I see my son as a distinguished visitor from a far off land who does not understand my customs. It is my goal to help him thrive in my land, but not at the point of a gun. When we run into a situation in which one of us is doing something that bothers the other, perhaps he wants to throw beans on the floor and I don't want him to, or I want to leave the park and he doesn't want to, I think some version of, this is what I want, this is what my distinguished foreign dignitary wants, what can we do to get both of our needs met in this situation? I think the best way to clarify these ideas is with concrete examples. So I'm going to start with a newborn baby because a lot of people how they uh, can imagine a little bit how they would treat older children with respect, but it is very hard for most people to imagine how they would give respect to a lump. So a newborn baby, scenario one, how he's fed. The controlling mom sees it as her job to get food into her baby. So she brings her baby to her breast, tickles his cheek to trigger his mouth opening reflex and puts her breast in his mouth. My proposed respectful mom does not think it would be respectful to just put something in someone's mouth, even a quadriplegic. She brings her baby to her breast so that her nipple is near his nose and mouth and he can smell what she's offering. If he wants to nurse, he, nurse, he is capable of opening his own mouth and doing so. Scenario two, a newborn baby and when he's fed. The controlling mom believes that to be a good mom, she's supposed to feed her baby every two hours. She has a handy little device that goes off every two hours, so she knows it's time to feed the baby. If he acts hungry before the two hours is up, she distracts him so that he learns to wait two hours. The respectful mom thinks refusing to feed her distinguished visitor when she is capable of accommodating him is disrespectful. So she feeds her baby when he's hungry. Maybe it's been one hour, maybe it's been three. Assuming these are interaction patterns and not single events, here is an analysis of what this newborn has learned. The respected baby is responsible for his eating. His mind is learning to connect the sensation of hunger with the solution, food. He must learn to recognize the sensation of hunger and communicate it to his mother. He has found a benevolent universe and he already sees himself as a capable actor in it. The controlled baby has food shoved in his mouth, whether he wants it or not, and it will be done when the clock says whether he's hungry or not. In his mind, the connection between hunger and food has not been made. Likewise, he has learned nothing about communication or self-assertion, except that there's no point since it doesn't work. This baby will oscillate between feelings of frustration and anger as he fails repeatedly to communicate to his mother and passive resignation as he tries to accept the universe that he has found. For the moms, the respectful mom is getting in tune with her baby. The controlling mom is getting in tune with her alarm clock, and whether she means to or not, she's showing her baby who is in control. It's not him. It's also not her. It's the alarm clock <laughs> and the script it represents. She's just doing what she's been told. Scenario three, a teething one-year-old bites his mom while nursing. The controlling mom believes it is her job to teach her child not to bite people. So she gives him a disapproving look. She says, bad boy, no biting. And she picks him up and she puts him in timeout for one minute because that's how long timeouts are when you are one year old. The respectful mom first responds authentically to what happened. She says, ow, you hurt me. She looks her baby in the eye, communicating her pain, and says, please don't bite me. But she looks around and grabs a nearby doll. You want to bite. Here's something you can bite. It won't hurt the doll. Analysis. The controlled baby has learned that he is bad, that his desire to bite is bad. He has learned that some people get to control others, that he is not the one in control, and that he has to please those in control or he will suffer. He has learned that not only should he not want what he wants, but trying to get what he wants could lead to pain. 
The respected baby has learned that it's okay for him to want what he wants. He wants to bite, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with him. There's no shame. On the contrary, his mother supports his desire to learn what he wants to learn. And she will help him get those needs met in a way that also works for her. Scenario four, eating dinner with a four-year-old. The controlling mom believes it is her job to get food into her child, especially vegetables. In order to accomplish this goal, she does a variety of things, begging him to take one more bite, bribing him with dessert, making macaroni and cheese every night because he won't eat anything else, and making vegetable purees and sneaking them into his macaroni and cheese. The respectful mom knows that she has to eat dinner, and she shares whatever she makes for herself with her child, just as she has since he was a baby. Tonight, she makes bratwurst, sauerkraut, and mashed potatoes. What her child decides to do at this point is his business. She talks to him during dinner. She doesn't even look at his plate. The controlled child has learned that he has to eat whether he's hungry or not. He has been taught not to listen to his body, to ignore his own perceptions of reality. He has been taught that sometimes you have to be sneaky to make people do what you want. He has learned that he does have some power in his relationship with his mom, the power to refuse food. He enjoys using this to get a little revenge on her. The respected child has been in charge of his eating since he was a baby. He has been eating whatever his mom makes since he was a baby. Sometimes he eats it, sometimes he doesn't. Especially if it's a new food, sometimes he doesn't even taste it. He eats vegetables when he wants to, but there's never been any pressure or guilt. He has no guilt associated with food. Eating is all his deal, his responsibility. He has learned that he is capable of taking care of himself in this way. He has learned to trust his body, to tell him how much to eat, that his perceptions of reality are valid. And most importantly, he knows that his body belongs to him. For me, the easiest part of the system of respect is relating to my son as a foreign dignitary. The hardest part was learning how to deal with my son's strong emotions. All children and adults experience very strong emotions. Communicating in a respectful way with children and adults who are feeling strong emotions is a learned skill. Failing to learn this skill is the main reason why parents who want to have respectful relationships with their children revert to various control tactics. I don't think a mutually respectful relationship is even possible if we don't learn this skill. Here's the wonderful problem with my parenting theory. We cannot give our children what we don't have, psychological economics. That means that this skill we must learn starts with us, the adults. It starts with how we think about and deal with our own strong emotions. We have been socialized with many ideas about emotions that are extremely destructive. One of them is the idea of emotional control. Since most people begin with the assumption that emotions are primary, they seek ways to control and influence their emotional states. But our emotions are not rewards and punishments. They are tools that let us know what is working and what needs our attention. Our strong emotions tell us, pay attention to this. If we listen, our emotions can be great aids in the pursuit of our values, but attempting to manipulate them, like attempting to command what we see or hear, is just refusing to acknowledge reality. It doesn't change reality, and it doesn't serve us. Nathaniel Brandon wrote, mental health does not require total omniscience about one's subconscious, but it does require the total absence on the conscious or subconscious level of any premise <coughs> forbidding knowledge. Earlier, I explained that a controlling approach to raising children creates a great deal of forbidden knowledge in emotional repression. The forbidding of knowledge, the parenting in God's Gulch, must yield the opposite. No repressions, no forbidden knowledge. This is hard to picture because most of us were raised to believe that we are good when we keep ourselves under control and bad when we lose control. And when we lose control, we must as quickly as possible get ourselves back under control perhaps with the help of a little alcohol, <coughs> sex, pharmaceuticals, television, computer games, excessive sleep or work. But just like our children, we are not actually getting in control so much as we are repressing our feelings. When I first pictured what unrepressed feelings might look like, I imagined a horror show of people freaking out all the time. Then I realized that I was still thinking in the operating system of control. It's the same false dichotomy as before, only this time, 
the threat is within you. Either you control your emotions or they control you. Either you are the master of your emotions or you're their slave. I would like to propose that again, this is not the choice. The actual choice is to know what we feel and respect that or to not know what we feel, consciousness or unconsciousness. Ayn Rand said, if men identified introspectively their inner states one-tenth as correctly as they identified their objective reality, we would be a race of ideal giants. I ascribe 95% or more of all psychological trouble and personal tragedies to the fact that in the realm of introspection, men are not only not taught to introspect, they are actively discouraged from engaging in it, and yet their lives depend on it. Introspection means constantly asking the question, what do I feel, and why do I feel it? And having the emotional skills to answer these questions without trying to repress the information. This means, according to Nathaniel Brandon, number one, we must not repress. We cannot examine a value we are not willing to realize we have. We must acknowledge what we are feeling, whatever we are feeling, the desire to hit our child, the desire to kick an innocent dog, if we judge an emotion as bad or undesirable, we will automatically repress it. So it's essential that the acknowledgement is respectful. If you want to bite, it's OK. It doesn't mean you get to, but it is OK to want to. Acknowledging that one is experiencing the emotion will stop the repression, and that is the goal. No forbidden knowledge. Number two, we must feel what we are feeling. Some psychological theories recommend saying, I'm angry, and then watching the anger float away as if it is not our anger. These theories teach us to not take responsibility for our feelings. Other popular theories tell us to acknowledge our negative feelings, but then find something more positive to focus on. What you focus on expands, they say, so don't focus on your negative emotions. But our emotions are not rewards and punishments for good or bad behavior. They evolved to be part of us because they serve us. They are there to help us get our needs met. If we do not focus on them, we cannot learn anything from them. Nathaniel Brandon advises us to go into our emotions and invite them into our conscious awareness. This step is crucial because this is how we gather as much information as possible. Emotions must be felt all the way because surface feelings are often misleading. Brandon wrote, learning the art of relating to emotions in this way is not easy. Therapy clients comment on their emotions. They explain their emotions. They apologize for their emotions. They speculate as to the historical origins of their emotions. And of course, they reproach themselves and even ridicule themselves for their emotions. But they find it extraordinarily difficult to simply let themselves feel their emotions. If we are willing to stay fully present in our emotions without denial or disowning, the result typically is not the collapse of reason, but the emergence of a more lucid awareness. In other words, feel deeply to think clearly. For example, I know that when I feel depressed, if I bring that depression into my conscious awareness and allow myself to feel it, I usually find out that I'm just exhausted. If I didn't take a minute to feel my depression, I would mistakenly think that depression is the problem rather than exhaustion. Three, we must reflect. Some psychological theories instruct us to ride the wave of an emotion. That's all we have to do since we are just victims of waves of emotions that wash over us. And though simply experiencing an emotion can be enough in some circumstances, emotions are not causeless and they should be examined. <clears throat> Our children will only be able to acknowledge, feel, and examine their uncomfortable feelings if we can model this for them and guide them from day one. So recall scenario two concerning when to feed a baby. When the respectful mom can accommodate her hungry baby, she does, but sometimes she cannot accommodate her hungry baby. Perhaps her baby communicates to her that he is hungry, but she's in the middle of cooking dinner, or perhaps she's driving home and it would be dangerous to pull over. At these times, the respectful mom tells her baby honestly that she knows what he wants, but she cannot accommodate him. She does not attempt to distract him from his disappointed feelings, but rather she listens empathetically to him while he expresses his disappointment. Her baby learns that sometimes his actions will not yield what he wants. Sometimes he will feel disappointment, and that's okay. 
Compare this to what the controlled baby learns. Whenever he's upset, his mother distracts him from how he feels, sometimes with bouncing motions and sometimes by shoving something shiny in his face. The controlled baby has gotten the message that the emotion he was expressing is not okay. And when he feels that emotion, he should distract himself. As he gets older, he will likely continue to distract himself with television, computer games, pharmaceuticals, work, sugar, alcohol, sex, or some other drug that enables him to maintain a facade of control. We can use any substance as a spice to spice up our lives, as a medicine to change how we're feeling, or as a drug to numb out. All my life, I thought I was managing my emotions expertly with a combination of chocolate, wine, movies, and lots of work when I needed them. But as I learned more about psychology, I realized that our drugs enable us to live lives we couldn't otherwise be living. Without our drugs, if you have to feel what you're feeling and what you're feeling is miserable, those very feelings, that very torture is what will lead you to change your life, to make decisions that will lead you to a life that you don't need to medicate or numb yourself away from. Because our children, or sorry, because we do not get to be warmly authoritative, benevolent dictators to our children, but we absolutely do want to influence the kind of people they become, our only option is to have an awesome, present, respectful relationship with ourselves and our children and to model how to live an awesome life. So instead of obsessing over our children and trying to make them be the person we dream they could be, the best way to parent is to focus on ourselves and make ourselves the person we dream we could be. Instead of, how can I get my kid to do what I know is best, the parents of Galt's Gulch think, be the hero you wish to see in your children. My vision of the heroic parents of Galt's Gulch is that they truly see their children in this moment. They truly understand their children, not their imagined children, but their real children. And they listen to what even their youngest children say they need. And they respect what their children say they don't need. They take their children seriously. And they treat their children's thoughts, values, and selves with respect. And they inspire their children by how they live their own lives. Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Our current parenting tools are not the tools with which a free society can be built. In fact, they are the tools that tear it down. Remember, the method is the message. When we live in the operating system of control, when we use the tools of control to fight for freedom and respect for individuals, when we fail to move out of the system of control psychologically, We've already lost. Our outer world reflects our inner world. This goes two ways. Right now, our government reflects our households, benevolent dictatorships, and our households reflect our personal psychological status, the operating system of control. Our current outer world does reflect our current inner world. If we want our outer world to be one of freedom and respect, our households and our own personal psychology must reflect that. I finished that so fast. You did, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think we have another 15 minutes or so if uh, people have questions. Wait, can I just say, I was stressing out about that so bad because when I timed that speech, it was 90 minutes. So I spent the last week just like cutting and cutting and cutting and being like, I can't cut this, I can't cut this. And I think I complained about this last night to a million people. And I was like, I guess I cut enough out. <laughs> I'm so excited right now. Um, questions? I have a question. Here. Uh, could you critique, critique this scenario, please? Uh, I'm a grandfather of uh, twin sons, eight years old, and of course I want to uh, well, the great thing about being great parents is you get all of the love and no responsibility. Uh, so I, I have responsibility for them for, for a couple of days. I only see them about once a year. And uh, uh, one of them started fighting the other, and uh, I said, uh, 
if you want to hit someone, hit yourself. <laughs> you know, that was pretty funny. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he eventually kept doing it, and I sent him a time out to his room. And I thought, uh, you know, he's going to hate me. <laughs> but uh, evidently, uh, talking to his father uh, the next few days after I'd gone back home, uh, he was asking about me, you know, oh, where's Grandpa Ron? <laughs> so, you know, what did I do right or wrong? Um, if I encountered two children fighting each other, I would I would stop them. Like say one is attacking the other, right? You don't have to hold back the one, you gotta hold back the other. So I would hold the one that's trying to hit the other one and I would say, you wanna hit him, I'm not gonna let you. You wanna hit him, I see that you wanna hit him. And he you know, struggles and he's like, oh, I hate him. And I'm like, oh my God, you, you really feel some strong feelings of hatred for him right now. And all I'm gonna do uh, is be the newscaster. And I'm gonna say, you know, I'm gonna keep um, reflecting back to him what he's feeling because if he can express what he's feeling he won't repress it and you get to much better places first of all if you can be present with your emotions then if you are repressing your emotions you'll generally be talking in abstract terms he's a jerk he's mean if you're in contact with your emotions you will be saying things like oh I hate it. I'm so angry and you'll be talking about how you feel and that is that will relieve a lot of the pressure um, but yeah, I'm just going to hold him and I'm going to say, I won't let you hit him. I see that you want to. Oh, I see how sad he looks, but I'm actually, you don't comment on how sad the other person looks until this person has had a chance to express themselves fully. I see how angry you are. I imagine you're angry because he took your toy. I, I, I see how badly you want to hit him. I'm not going to let you. I see how badly you want to. Thanks. But otherwise, you're a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> We all love hearing that. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Thank you for, for a fascinating talk. And uh, you uh, talked about impressing emotions. And I was wondering in what, what sense are you using uh, the term repression? Is it synonymous with suppression? Or is it in the Freudian sense of repression or something else? Uh, I assume that I'm part of the sense of repression. And what, how is that defined? It just means. Um, not being willing to, to know what you're feeling. So, um, for example, before this talk, uh, I told someone that I was feeling anxious, and she was like, oh, no, like, um, what, what did, where is she? What did she say? And I was like, actually, it's really important for me to acknowledge that I'm feeling anxious, because that, that brings the feeling to the surface, and then I don't have to uh, stuff it down. So, it takes a lot of energy to repress your feelings, to, well, I guess the difference between repression and suppression would be suppression, you don't even know of it. So keeping it down, exhausting. And I would get up here and I'd be like this because I'm expending so much energy keeping down those feelings. Whereas if I can bring them to the surface and say, this is what I'm feeling, my conscious awareness, my subconscious that was pinging me and being like, hey, hey, I need your attention. Hey, I need your attention. It can calm down. So I'm using it in the sense of, calming down my subconscious. Does that answer your question? There, actually, I have a quick description of uh, Brandon's view of your emotions that just sticks in my own mind. Your emotions are automatic reactions to a set of circumstances based on the belief system you program your subconscious to believe. So if you don't allow yourself to emote, you're shutting down your ability to even understand yourself, basically. So. Feel it if you decide that it's not appropriate to yeah. change the belief system. That's especially what he said. At least that's how I read it. Well, no, that's that's step three. That you have to examine it. Yes, like, exactly. why do I feel it's very? Why do I feel depressed instead of tired? What what um, abstract rule in my head makes it more shameful for me to be exhausted? than to be depressed. Right. It's, it's better to be sad and miserable than it is to admit you're tired and you gotta go home and take a nap. You know? And a lot of that is the feeling guilty because you're not doing what you were trained to do when actually you were probably trained to do something that's totally appropriate, or could be. Uh, actually, this is an extension of the earlier question. Uh, at what, in what way, when you allow the uh, expression of emotions of children, even if they're not in the presence, of you or someone who can provide the guidance, how do they learn about property rights, including ownership of themselves and the ownership of the, the extension into private property? I don't understand. Well, you were saying you can hold them from hitting somebody if you're there. 
Right. And allow them to express themselves. But if you're not there, how did they learn about property rights? Well, okay, so for example, my son, he knew about property rights by the time he was like one. He was like, if a stranger tried to pick him up, he would be like, oh, hell no, you do not touch my body. And today he's four, and if somebody even like elbows him, he'll be like, excuse me, this is my body. You can't touch it unless I give you permission. <laughs> because I've, I've raised him to believe that he owns his body. And even when he was an infant, I would, I would say, you know, I'm going to pick you up now. May I pick you up now? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the changing table or whatever. I'm, may I pick you up? And I wouldn't pick him up or touch his body until he would look up at me. And I would pick him up and take him. So he has very clear property rights. He also, you know, he gets to own his stuff. So he knows that he can destroy his toys, but he may not destroy mine. Um, so he's pretty clear, but it doesn't mean that there aren't moments when he would really like to break my computer or my phone or something. Um, and, and so that's, that's a different situation. Um, what was, wait, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry, I did not know. What would you do if you did? Oh, and then I came in later. Okay, so I'm not there to stop this horrible thing that happened and I walk in later. I'm gonna talk about how I'm feeling. I'm gonna say, I see my computer is broken. Oh my God, what happened? I am feeling so angry right now. Oh my God, I could just explode. That's how angry I'm feeling. I would express how I'm feeling. And I would talk about I, though. I wouldn't say, you are a bad, like I wouldn't talk about you. I would talk about I. And I would, pro and I, if, I, if, if he broke my computer, I'd probably need to first be angry, and then I'd need to cry. Most of us, like, I would just need to cry. And he, would get a chance to see me. He, he'd get a chance to just, and, and he has seen me, like be very upset about something. And, and he gets to watch, like, oh, this is, this is what happens if I do this. And he gets to decide for himself, do I like this? Do I like causing this person this much pain? Was that fun for me? I thought it would be fun, but it's not actually fun. This is actually really miserable. I, when I get upset, my son usually tries to give me a hug. He's very, um, He's, he's pretty skilled emotionally as a four, for a four-year-old. I didn't see that he would uh, feel bad about causing a bad emotion. At what stage did he learn about the responsibility of not harming someone else's property like a person? Well, I would say that he's, he tries already. Like, he, he's always tried. Like, he's always... But I, um, from what I've read, it happens later than you want, but it happens for the right reasons. So it's probably gonna be around the age of six to eight is when they really start to internalize their own feelings of morality. Um, and and it's, it's beautiful, but it also, it doesn't happen as often as you want. There are times when people desire to hurt other people and they're not trying to, I mean, this is, again, my son isn't, four, isn't eight yet so I'm not talking from personal experience now. I'm talking about what I've read about other parents who raise their children this way. So it happens later than you want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was nice, nice meeting you, and thank you for encouraging me to come. Um, it was uh, very good. A uh, question I have is, how would spirituality or religion fit into this way of living and parenting? Because I heard you mention that at the beginning, so I'm just, Hear that I mean, that's a huge, can you give me a spirituality or a religion? I mean, you had mentioned that if someone were to follow like a spirituality or religious belief or and there was this greater being, how would that fit into, into this way of parenting and how would you incorporate that? Okay, so I think the way to answer your question is um, a, if, if, I, if I need a greater being in my life or a spirituality, it has to reflect um, my ideology. So right now, um, for example, the, the Christian religion that creates a king on high who gets to tell you what to do, that's a problem. Um, that's a problem for people who want freedom because their entire basis in life is to follow what this guy said and not to be follow their own individual sense of right and wrong. Um, but I know that people interpret it different ways. I'm, I wasn't raised religiously, so I'm not an expert in religions. Um, what I do know is that creating a situation in which someone is, is watching you and judging you, 
isn't going to lead to a very healthy place. Um, but there are a lot of other religions too. Um, I know the, the, the Buddhist religion, um, Nathaniel Brennan has written about that. Again, I'm not an expert, so all I can do is say, I read something that Nathaniel Brandon wrote about Buddhism um, in, in which um, it's, it's a, you don't take responsibility for your emotions and your goal is to be like the master, the super master of repression. But if someone was following Buddhism or Christianity or some other form of religion or spirituality, but let's say it was, it was working in their life and it was, it was healthy and they were living, you know, it was working, and would you recommend changing it and trying not to follow the master? How, how, would, that, how would that play? I don't really understand. If you believe in something, the only way to change that belief is to come in, is to get out of your abstracting brain, come into your perceptual brain, and re-perceive. So you you can't top down it. You can't say, "All right, I've rationally decided that I will never do, I will never think X, Y, and Z again." What you have to do is bring conscious awareness. So you bring <coughs> presence and conscious awareness. If you re-perceive reality and you decide, "Okay, so there isn't there isn't a god like I thought." Um, you will still probably have to do that many times before it becomes your new abstract rule. I'm actually very interested in that subject, like how we change our abstract rules. Um, yeah, my, my children are, um, uh, in the early 20s, and, and I sort of, uh, so I kind of muddled through and made it up as I went along to kind of find the theory. Um, and I think I brought them up with a, with a disastrous um, combination of behaviorism and respect. I don't know. Anyway, it's going to be interesting that all right. Um, but what I was going to say about your, your uh, this scenario of the, the computer breaking and, and showing your emotions is that I don't think you can get away from uh, the fact that parenting is a bit of a performance, um, because you were saying that control parenting is, is, is often a performance. I think respectful parenting is too because you have to illustrate your emotions, which you don't normally have to do. If you walk into a room and a vase has fallen off a shelf and broken, you, 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 you don't have to display any external characteristics. Whereas if you're trying to model something for the child, you have to verbalize and show, and so you, you I, I, I found I couldn't get away from, I mean, what you said about this sort of being authentically present with your children, that really hit a, hit a chord, because it is very difficult. You do put on a show, and now that the children have left home, I'm very conscious of the fact that when they come back, I change my behavior again. So it's a very difficult line uh, to, to, to it, it, it's difficult, I'm not sure in practice that you can get away from it being a little bit of a, of a performance, you're an interpreter. There, there's many wonderful terms that you that you use, um, and I think that's just one that I I, I can't find a way to, um, to to get away from. I in part agree with you, um, but I also I disagree that uh, it, I, I I agree with you and and disagree. Um, if if your if my computer's broken and what I how I want to react is to just be like my computer's broken, and go to my room and shut the door, that's how I'm gonna react. I'm, I'm not, I, I, I didn't pretend to react that way be, to put on a show for my kid. I, that's how I imagined I would actually react. Um, there are times when my son does something that upsets me so much that I, I can't deal with it right now, and I just say, I'm very upset and I can't deal with it right now, I need to be alone. And I go in my room and I close my door because I, and it usually, you know, I, it, like a minute or two because I'm so upset. And sometimes it's because you are so upset that you want to beat the crap out of that guy. Like he pissed you off and you really want to. And so you go in your room and you close your door because you are not going to do that, but you are going to be aware that that's how you feel. Um, so I, I, I agree with you that um, for example, being a newscaster, I am, in a sense, uh, doing my job, but um, hopefully in an authentic way rather than an than a inauthentic way because I get to write my job description and I get to decide. It's like um, you get to decide in a relationship, like in a, in a script role parenting, you're taking somebody else's instructions. In yours, you get to decide. So. 
maybe today I'm going to be a newscaster and tomorrow I'm going to be like, you guys can kill each other. I really couldn't care less right now. Because that's what's real right now. Um, and you can always talk about it later, you know. Well, it's going to be tough, and I really enjoyed that. But it's, it's never going to be perfect. No. I don't want to, like, present a, you know, at my household, my parenting is perfect. My <laughs> child is perfect. I'm perfect. Like, I don't want to. You mentioned um, either master of your emotion or slave to your emotions. So, I've got two questions. At what age can a young person become master of their emotions in your mind? And then the question about conflict resolution to young people fighting over a toy. All right, this is my toy. How do you intervene at home? You said you're going to hit somebody. Wait, wait, give me one question at a time. At what age, at what age do you feel young people become master of their emotions? Um, I think, well, okay, so for example, most kids who are six months old can already exhibit control patterns. And being a master of your emotion would be having control patterns surrounding your emotions. So i um, not exactly sure how you're using the term, but a six-month-old will master his desire to cry by sticking his thumb in his mouth, like, shut up. And, um, and a, a three-year-old might master his desire to, um, to hit another kid by like sneakily getting a big like scoop of sand and walking over and like pouring it on his head. And in that way, he mastered one emotion. Um, so being controlling yourself uh, looks different depending on the age you're at. I know that preschool teachers require children to be able to control themselves to a certain extent by the time they're three. It's like your kid better be able to not hit other children most of the time or bite them most of the time. Um, but like for example, um, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by master of your emotions. Because I'm not... I, I, <laughs> I guess it means a kind of slide scale thing on the situation. Because that, that's fine. The next question is a conflict resolution. So if you have two young people, depending on the age, say, call it four, four years old or three years, and they're fighting over a toy, right? Mm -hmm. This is my truck. You can't do anything. No, it's mine. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. Then how would you do it? Okay, so... Um, you guys both want the same toy. You're pulling on it. Now you're pulling on it. I'm not going to let you touch his arm, but you can both, they're, they're allowed to pull on the toy. Um, but it, it depends on whose toy it is. That assumes, assumes it's my toy. Because if it's, if it's your toy, then I would say, you're trying to take his toy. He doesn't want you to take his toy. And it's his toy. So I'm not going to let you take his toy. It belongs to him. Um, so it, just differentiating Well, it just, you got to give me more information about the scenario. <laughs> but otherwise, no, you just keep newscasting. You keep newscasting. They can't touch each other, but they can pull on the toy. And you, you want the toy. You want the toy. You both really want this toy. Oh, you look angry. Oh, you look like you're about to hit him. I'm not going to let you hit him. I see you really want that toy. And it, also, it honestly doesn't take very long. They, they pull on the toy for like three seconds and one of them bursts into tears or, the, or one of them like notices that the exact same toy is over there. It doesn't, it, they resolve it pretty fast. Uh, hi, uh, so I was reading an article about education and now there are these two concepts that are very like being uh, talked about this uh, fixed mindset and growth oriented mindset. And I was wondering if you think that a control of bringing leads to a fixed oriented mindset where uh, if you make a mistake, you think it's your fault and you can't change that. Whereas a growth oriented mindset is that if you make a mistake, if you work hard, you can actually improve that. Yeah, no, um, I'm going to translate it into, you know, it's like, no, 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 I'm, no, 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 I'm going to translate it into the language that I speak, which is really half of what I do when I'm reading. Um, um, you create abstract rules, and a person in a fixed mindset has created a set of abstract rules by which he's going to live his life, and he is, he cannot make new ones. He's really bad at creating a new abstract rule for a different situation. So he had this abstract rule that to be a good boy, he needed to eat a lot. 
because you know that's his mom always told him to eat a lot, but now it's not serving him because now he's like 20 and he's just gaining a lot of weight. And that abstract rule to like finish his plate is no longer serving him. But he finds that he still always finishes his plate. Like what? So um, in order to make a new abstract rule, he needs to re-perceive. So he needs to bring conscious awareness every time he sits down to eat, like a great deal of perception, like perceiving my body, perceiving what I'm doing. Um, so from where, from in my language, the fixed mindset people live very abstractly and they're very bad at coming into the present and re-perceiving something. Um, and a lot of us struggle with that. A lot of the major messages of religion, like the, in, in fact, the incredible messages that I love in religion is come into the present. We spend so much of our time stuck in our heads and just coming into the present, your brain was designed to abstract and it was designed to perceive. And mm -hmm. it's so relaxing to just take a minute and like perceive, like you just look around and you listen and you, and you feel the sensations in your body. That is, according to Nathaniel Brandon, the only healthy way to rewrite an abstraction. Um, it's just conscious awareness. So, um, do you think like uh, cultural but really your outcome leads to this kind of mindset? Yeah, because anything that gets in the way of your ability to be conscious, so you're trying to reprogram yourself, but when you attempt to feel your certain feelings, you're not allowed to feel those feelings, so you can't actually reprogram yourself because that's just not allowed. Um, I think also childhood can be very traumatizing, and some abstractions become very like trauma, trauma abstractions, like you will not change that one. Um, but I do think that it's not solvable in the human race. Your brain will abstract, it will create abstract rules, your brain will benefit from perception, and you will always be able to change your abstract rules with your perception, but it, that, that's gonna be a lesson that everyone has to learn in, in a free society too. You're not gonna come up with a set of abstract rules that will work for every situation at all times, ever. Yeah. Yes, gentleman in the cowboy hat. Could you please uh, delve into the psychology and uh, the school system a bit more? You touched on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Uh, are there any other areas in modern schooling uh, yeah. where the psychology of children is being impacted in your view? Uh, I don't. I, I'm. I don't think you can send your kids to school and have them come out very well. Um, yeah, they, it, I mean, studies have shown when you go into kindergarten, you're almost your whole world is intrinsic motivation. By the time you're a senior in high school, nothing. Like that kid is destroyed. <laughs> and it, and and it's according to um, you know. Eric Erickson, you will at some point between 30 and 60 have a reorientation of your motivation, also called the midlife crisis, in which you discover, oh my God, what have I just done with my life? Like I didn't actually care about any of this. Um, you know, I would rather see that whole like chunk from 10 to 50, like why did you, you wasted your best years? Um, one other interesting thing, John Taylor Goddard, because you mentioned you liked him, um, had mentioned I think that most, uh, that one of the reasons that school went from being like, a long time ago, you finished school when you were 12, 12 or 14. You went to college when you were 12. You finished college at 16. But then they realized that most revolutionaries, most people who start revolutions, are between the age of 12 and 21. And so if we can just keep kids busy until they're 21, they will not rebel against their governments. But also they won't start their own businesses. Most people who are entrepreneurial and will start their own business <coughs> will do it between the age of 12 and 21. And this is stuff they were noticing in the 1700s. And this is, and discussing it. Like, okay, so how can we encourage, we need more kids in the factories. We need more kids to work for big business and less entrepreneurs. And we can do that by keeping kids busy till they're 21. So, yeah, I, I, again, I'm not a big fan. I'm big, yeah. Um, even in the absence of explicit punishment and abolition, I seem to have a desire to please their parents. Yeah. It seems to me they're happy when you're happy with life when you're sad. Should parents be resisting the temptation to exploit that? <laughs> 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 it's beautiful, actually. You can admit that. <laughs> um, I, 
let's see. I do uh, note, I mean, that's, that's the interesting thing about having a really respectful relationship with your kid. Like, if you saw me in a grocery store with my son, um, you might think that I'm a really authoritative parent and he really has to do what I say, you know, the minute I say it because he's, he's so responsive to, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. I don't like it when you do that. He's very responsive. Um, but should you exploit that? Like, I don't, I, I, is it a tool? Is it a method, like you said, like, oh. you cry sometimes and mm -hmm. they respond to that? That's sort of the way that, right? I mean, would you actually cry? Oh, if my computer broke, I would cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my life. Um, I might be numb for a couple minutes before I cried, but I would cry. Um, but, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't try to exploit. No, oh, like, no, I don't try to control my son. Like, I, I'm very, like, um, or my husband. You know, it's like if you, I used to start this talk by, by, with a scenario, you know, you can Google, like, how to get your husband to take out the trash. And it's like, reward good behavior, the sexier, the better. <laughs> And um, it's, it's like, we live in this world where all we know about relationships in order to get our needs met, it's like, I'm not gonna even ask you to meet my needs, I'm gonna trick you into meeting my needs. And, and so I don't have that, I try not to relate in that way to anyone. And it doesn't mean that my brain won't offer that. Like your brain is always gonna be like, or you could manipulate them. But I try to be very honest and forthright and open, like these are my needs and this is what I want and you can meet my needs or not, it's your choice. And if you choose not to meet my needs, I will probably be sad, but I don't get to force you. I'm not, even with my four-year-old, I'm not gonna trick him. I'm not gonna try and trick him into meeting my needs. Because I don't want him to try and trick me into meeting his needs. Like, I wanna have... Rosalind, just one quick last question. Hello, Rosalind. Hi, Mr. Um, I just had a quick question about the individual that is trying to feel a feeling that may be uncomfortable. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we do so uh, because it may lead to the emergence of lucid thinking. I can definitely sometimes feel like when I'm trying to do that, it's like, is this really worth it to feel this feeling? It feels awful. YouTube is so much better. So I, I just, my question is about insight. It, do you, is there anything you tell yourself when you're trying to feel a feeling that's uncomfortable? How do you navigate that? Um. I'm gonna actually talk about my husband because he, um, for me, I, I'm at this point, like pain is just pain. Like, I'm sorry, but I had a, I, I had a baby. Like, <laughs> pain is just pain. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, but uh, my husband, for him, uh, he used to go to work and then come home and deal with his exhaustion by numbing out in front of the TV. And after he started to learn more about psychology too, he decided he wasn't gonna allow himself his drugs. And I do the same thing. I am allowed to watch TV, have alcohol, have chocolate, but only if it's a spice to spice up and enrich my life. If I'm trying to use it to change my emotional state or, as a, or to numb out, I, that's my new abstract rule. I don't do that. So unless, well, I can do it, but I have to bring conscious awareness to it. So. Um, but my husband would come home and just sit down and it's like this, this dump because you haven't perceived the whole day. All of these things you would have perceived like your back is uncomfortable, you had to go to the bathroom, you were hungry, like all of this, this you've been up here and you're exhausted. And so he would sit there and he would just be in pain, like what you're talking about. And it was miserable and uncomfortable and he would talk about it. And what he found is that in order to numb out and recover and then get back to being a regular guy, it would take like 15 hours of numbing out, like he could watch TV for 15 hours. But if he just took the pain, he would sit there on his bed and just be like, pain, <laughs> for like two and a half hours. And then he'd get up and he'd hang out with us. And I was like, this is amazing, like he has so much more time. Um, but the other thing that happened is that he realized he couldn't live in LA anymore and wanted to move to a farm in Nicaragua. And that's, I mean, this man has been talking about doing that for five years. But it wasn't until he stopped doing his drugs. Once he took away his drugs, he couldn't keep living this life. I mean, it really is like you use your little numbing thing to get yourself to do what you honestly should, probably shouldn't be doing. 
Thank you very much.